All right, we can go ahead and get started then. So um, today we're going to be learning about chapter 15, chemical equilibrium. It's all about balance, right? So in this chapter, uh, this is what we're going to learn. I'm going to introduce the equilibrium constant, K, which, of course, is different from the rate law constant. Okay? And we're going to learn about two different types of equilibrium constant. There's Kc and Kp. So Kc would be the equilibrium constant in terms of concentration. Kp, can you guys guess what Kp is? In terms of pressure. Yes, that is correct. Um, and then we'll look at s several scenarios on how to calculate K, which is the equilibrium constant. And we're going to compare what reaction quotient is. Um, so reaction quotient Q will tell us, will help us predict how the reaction will go. Is it going to the right towards the product, or is it going in the direction of the reactants to the left? And finally, we'll talk about Le Chatelier's uh, principle, um, which is related to how concentrations, temperature, and pressure affect the reaction. All right, so I'm going to start off by, um, by I want to talk about hemoglobin. Okay, so as you all know, you've probably heard of this before uh, from your biology class or maybe even in high school. Uh, hemoglobin is a metal protein complex, right, that basically delivers oxygen from your lungs to different parts of the body. Okay, so it's like a mailman. Right? And hemoglobin basically contains iron, which is the metal part, and heme, which is the protein. And so you have actually four subunits of uh, heme. So that means that hemoglobin can carry a total of four oxygen molecules and deliver it to several parts of the body that are uh, oxygen deficient. Okay? So um, this is the chemical reaction between hemoglobin and oxygen gas, and it's a equilibrium type of reaction. So you see this double arrow here that indicates um, equilibrium. So that means that it can go both ways, right? It can go in the forward direction towards the products, or it can go towards the reactants, which is reverse reaction. Okay, so the relative amounts of the hemoglobin, oxygen, and the complex here at equilibrium are related to the equilibrium constant. And this is something that we can calculate depending on the concentrations of these uh, components at equilibrium. So what does it tell us if we have a large value of K, if we have a large equilibrium constant? Well, that means that it favors the product, okay? Because, uh, as I'll show you later on, the, the equation for equilibrium constant, you'll have high concentration of the product. And so that's why it favors the synthesis of the product. If you have small values of K, that means that the reactant concentration will be higher than the concentration of the products, which means that the reactants are favored in that chemical reaction. So changing the concentration of any one of these necessitates changes to the other concentrations in order to restore that equilibrium. Okay, so for example, looking at this equation again, whenever you take a deep breath, right, the concentration of oxygen in your lungs increases. And so looking at this chemical reaction, uh, you'll see that it will favor the products. Okay? It will force the reaction to go forward when you, when you increase the concentration of oxygen. So you're forcing the hemoglobin to basically bind to the oxygen to make the complex, hemoglobin-oxygen complex. Okay? And so hemoglobin travels in your bloodstream. Right? It goes to every part of your body. And then it delivers that package, that oxygen, to the oxygen um, lacking regions. Okay? And this is all due to the equilibrium, right? 
So your muscles usually have low oxygen level, and so because of that, the HBO2 hemoglobin oxygen complex will be forced to unbind, right, and uh, deliver that oxygen to those muscles. So th this means that the reaction will shift to the left, which means that the hemoglobin will um, unbind with, from the oxygen. All right, so that's basically the importance of learning about equilibrium constants. So let's consider this reaction equation here, in which we have hydrogen gas reacting with iodine gas to form hydrogen iodide. Uh, when this reaction starts, the reactants are consumed and the products are made, right? And so in terms of concentration, the reactant concentration will decrease and the product concentration will increase over time. So again, your forward reaction means that it goes towards the product and the reverse reaction means that it goes to the left, right, towards the reactants. All right, so as I mentioned, reactant concentration will eventually decrease and the product concentration will increase over time. So this next statement here, as reactant concentration decreases, the forward reaction rate also decreases. Unless, what order of reaction are we talking about? Unless it's zero order, then it doesn't matter what the concentration is, right? Because zero order reactions are independent of um, concentrations. Same thing over here. Um, generally speaking, as product concentration increases, the reverse reaction rate also increases. So that means that the products can react to reform some of the products, uh, some of the reactants. They'll break down into the reactants. So we learned dynamic equilibrium in the past, in chapter 11, even in chapter 13 and 14. Dynamic equilibrium means that the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay. So in terms of evaporation, the rate of evaporation is equivalent to the rate of condensation. That would be dynamic equilibrium as well, in terms of uh, solutions. All right, so this also means that the mm -hmm. concentration of the product and the reactants will remain constant. Okay, they're no longer changing once you reach the dynamic equilibrium. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the concentration of the product equals the concentration of the reactant. Okay, it's possible they can get that, but um, most of the time, they're not the same in terms of concentration. And this also means that the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are both happening at the same time, the same rate. Right? All right, so um, processes that proceed in both the forward and reverse directions are said to be reversible, right? which makes a lot of sense. That's why you have this double arrow here. Reactants can turn into products and vice versa at equilibrium. So there are chemical reaction equations in which you can only go in one direction, right? Uh, for example, if you were to ionize hydrogen chloride in water, because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, it will only go one direction, which is the ionization of HCl. And we'll learn that um, in the next chapter, I think, or chapter 16, yeah. All right, um, so how do we define equilibrium constant? So equilibrium constant is defined by the law of mass action. And this is uh, summarized in this equation. So you have equilibrium constant K, which is equivalent to the concentration of the products raised to the coefficient, right? Divided by the reactant concentration raised to their coefficients as well. So you always want to take into account the uh, stoichiometry, right, the coefficients. And this is known as the law of mass action, which is the relationship between the chemical equation 
and the concentrations of reactants and products. So um, considering this reaction equation here, for instance, um, how, do we, how do you generate the equilibrium constant expression? Right? How do you express the equilibrium constant in terms of reactants and products? So over here, you can see that the coefficient of nitrogen pentoxide is 2. The coefficient for nitrogen dioxide is 4 and one for oxygen gas. So to generate the K expression, um, you would e make that equivalent to uh, the concentration of the nitrogen dioxide raised to the fourth power, its coefficient, times the concentration of the oxygen gas raised to uh, the first power, divided by concentration of N2O5, nitrogen pentoxide, raised to the second power. So that would be the expression for the equilibrium constant K. And it's always in that uh, sequence. So you have the products in the numerator divided by the reactants, okay, concentration of the reactants. All right, let's take a look at some examples here. So let's look at hydrogen gas reacting with brom bromine gas. How would you generate the expression for equilibrium constant K? All right, so here we have the products and we have the reactants here. So your K expression would be the concentration of the product raised to the second power because of the coefficient. And you divide that by concentrations of the reactants raised to their coefficients. So this would be the expression for K for the first uh, reaction here. And we can do the same thing for the second one. Uh, again, you have products here. You have reactants on the left-hand side. And so K would be concentration of NO raised to the second power divided by the product of the reactants raised to their coefficients. So, so far so good, pretty straightforward. Okay, so one other thing is that the equilibrium constant, it's actually unitless, okay? So you might wanna remember that so there's no unit, but um, the concentrations of the products and the reactants are expressed in molarity. All right, let's look at another example here. Express the equilibrium constant for the following chemical reaction equations. What do you think is the equation for the first one? So you have methanol and it gets broken down into carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. What would be the equilibrium expression for this? Okay, K equals? Um, concentration of CO. Yes. Times the concentration of H squared. Concentration of H2 raised to the second power because of the coefficient of hydrogen gas, right? And then you divide that by concentration of CH3OH. Okay, and then we can do the same thing for the second equation here. K equals CO2 raised to the third power times concentration of H2O raised to the fourth power divided by C3H8 and oxygen gas raised to the fifth power. So that would be the expression for the equilibrium constant for this specific equation reaction equation. Okay, so just letting you guys know that the concentrations here that we're talking about, it's not the initial concentrations. It's the concentration of the products and reactants at equilibrium. Okay. 
So you perform the experiment, you react the reactants, and then over time they'll reach that equilibrium, right? And so at equilibrium, of course, you'll have different concentrations of products and reactants. All right, so what does K tell us, right? Um, so again, considering this reaction equation here between hydrogen gas and bromine gas, if the equilibrium constant K is much larger than one, then that means that the concentration of the products is larger, much larger than that, those of the products, or reactants, sorry. Okay. So product concentration will be much higher compared to the reactant concentration at equilibrium. This also suggests that the products are favored in that chemical reaction. Okay, that means you're making, you're synthesizing more of the products than the reactants. Okay. But if the equilibrium constant K is much less than one, then that means you have a lot of the reactants compared to the products. And so the reactants are favored in that chemical reaction equation. And so it goes to the left. That's what it means, right? It shifts the reaction to the left. So one example is that um, hemoglobin reaction, right? Hemoglobin and oxygen gas. And so if you are, if you have a lot of the oxygen gas, then the forward reaction will be favored, making more of the products. Okay. If the K value is about one, that means that the concentration of the products equal the concentration of the reactants. Okay. All right, so this slide right here basically just illustrates what it looks like if you have a large number of K versus a smaller number of K. So if K is a large number, then that means you have a lot of these products, hydrogen bromide. Okay, so you can see that if you were to just count the number of hydrogen bromides here, you have one, two, three, four, five, about nine hydrogen bromide uh, compared to bromine gas and hydrogen gas. So you have a lot more of the products compared to the reactants. If you have a small number of K, then you have more of the reactants compared to the products. All right, so let's look at this um, example here. Consider the reaction between A and B. So you have A, which is the reactant, turning into product B. The images shown below illustrate the equilibrium mixtures of A, which is red, uh, and B, represented by black spheres, at three different temperatures. At which temperature do you think is the equilibrium constant the largest? You think it's the third one? Mm -hmm. Seems so confident. Carlin, what do you think? Um, Bishop? Do you think it's the third temperature, T3? And if it is T3, why? Why is it T3? Because <coughs> a higher concentration of um, products. Right, because of just the fact that you have a lot more of the black spheres, which is the product compared to the reactants. So yes, the answer here is T3. All right. So what would happen to K if we were to change the chemical reaction equation? Okay. The only way we can change the chemical reaction equation is by reversing the reaction, by adding reactions together, and by, let's see, so I reverse reaction, adding reactions, what's the third one? Multiplying um, the coefficients by a certain number, okay? So what would happen to K if we were to reverse the reaction, okay? So let's consider this general equation, right? What would be the equilibrium constant expression for this specific reaction? 
So we've done this. Uh, it looks something like this, right? So you have the products raised to their coefficients divided by the reactants raised to their coefficients. If you were to reverse this, then now you have C and D as your reactants and then A and B as your products, right? And so when you write the equilibrium constant expression for this, it would just be the products A and B raised to their coefficients divided by the reactants C and D raised to their coefficients. And so what is the difference between K forward and K reverse? If you look at the uh, expression. At the same point. Huh? Like, What's the similarity or the difference? Huh? Uh, they're just one over each other. Right. It's just one over the other, right? It's the reciprocal. So that means that if you were to reverse a reaction, you're taking the inverse of the value of K. So that's what it means. So K reverse is equivalent to 1 over K over forward. All right, so for example, um, here's an equation. So for a forward reaction, you would have um, Right, I was supposed to write on it. Um, you would have this. Okay, so it's, it's the concentration of the product raised to the second power divided by the concentrations of the reactants. And the reverse would be the inverse of K forward. All right, um, what if we were to change the coefficient, meaning you multiply the entire reaction equation by a certain number, right? Two, three, four. What happens to the equilibrium constant? So here it says, when the, when the coefficients of an equation are multiplied by a factor, the equilibrium constant is raised to that factor. Because again, the coefficients are your exponents in the equilibrium expression. So for example, if we have this reaction, a plus B turning into C, it would look something like this, right? The equilibrium expression. But if you were to multiply this by a number N, for example, then you're basically just multiplying or raising K to the power of N. Right. So your new equilibrium constant is equivalent to K raised to the N power. So here's an example. So normal K here, you would have concentration of NO raised to the second power divided by concentration of oxygen gas and concentration of nitrogen gas. So if we were to multiply this entire overall equation by three, this statement right here tells us that k, you just raise k to the third power. Okay. So your new k value is equivalent to k raised to the third power because then you would have this general equation. If you were to multiply by 3, you would now have 3n2 plus 3o2. 6NO. And so if you were to write the uh, expression for this, it would be oh, concentration of NO raised to the 6th power divided by concentration of N2 to the 3rd power times concentration of oxygen also to the 3rd power. Okay, So if you were to raise this thing to the third power, then you have basically this. Okay. Concentration of nitrogen monoxide raised to the sixth power divided by the reactants. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> All right. OK, um, so this is the answer.
Okay, so the third modification here is when you add equations together, okay? When you add the equations and they have their specific equilibrium constant values, what you do is you multiply the two constants, okay? So when you add equations to get a new equation, the k of the new equation is just the product of the k's of the old equations. Okay, so for example, if we have this, these two reactions right here, and you can write K1 and K2, what would be the equilibrium constant expression for the reactant A turning into C? Okay. So you can see here that if you were to write the equilibrium constant for this, Right. I'm just going to call this K3. This is equivalent to the concentration of the product raised to the coefficient divided by A raised to its coefficient. So given these two equilibrium constants, right, how do we get K3 if we were to add these two reaction equations? So again, if you were to add equations one and two here, the B's cancel, and you're left with that reaction equation, All right? So how do you get K3 from K1 and K2? You just multiply the two Ks, yes. So K1 times K2 should equal K3, and we can prove that. So K1, for example, is B raised to its coefficient divided by A times K2, which is C to the C power, concentration of B raised to the B. Okay? You can see that the Bs cancel out here, and you're left with Concentration of C raised to the coefficient divided by concentration of A raised to its coefficient, which is equivalent to this. All right, do you guys have any questions so far? So that's how you, um, how equilibrium constant K and changes in chemical equations are connected or related. All right, let's look at an example here. Consider the chemical equation and equilibrium constant for the synthesis of ammonia at 25 degrees Celsius. So basically you're just reacting nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and you, you get nit um, ammonia, NH3. And it gives you the equilibrium constant here. Calculate the equilibrium constant for the following reaction also at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, now you have ammonia breaking down into nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. So what would be the value, the new value of K for this specific chemical reaction? What would be the first step? Right, so <clears throat> so this right here, you see that the NH3 is on the reactant side, but the equation that we know here is on the right-hand side. So we would have to reverse this reaction, right? So the first step is to reverse the reaction. So now we have... 2NH3, so I'm reversing this reaction here. 2NH3 turning into nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. Okay, so if we reverse the reaction, what happens to K? You take the inverse, yes. So we have 1 over 5.6 times 10 to the fifth power. And then what? Step two is to notice that the coefficients are cut in half. 
Right, so step two, you divide it by half, right? Or you, or you multiply it by one half. So if you multiply one half to this, then you have NH3, one half, ooh, one half of N2 and three over half H2, okay? Which is the reaction that we want, right? We're trying to get this K value. So if you were to multiply by half, what happens to the K value? You raise it by a half. So 1 over 5.6 times 10 to the fifth power raised to 1 half. So the new K value then, but you just plug this into the calculator and we get the answer. and we get 0 0.00134, or basically 1.34 times 10 to the negative three. So far so good. Is my handwriting any better now? the same. All right, here's another uh, example. So maybe I can give you guys two minutes to solve this one out. So you have the following chemical equation and you want to determine the new equilibrium constant K. Six power. So this is something that you can actually do in your head um, and then just plug in the numbers in the calculator. All right, did anyone get an answer? Mr. Mignot. Um, 2.066 times 10 to the negative 13. That is correct. Well done. All right, so how do we how do we get there? So you can see here, all right, so for the second equation here, the COF2 was multiplied by two, or the entire reaction was multiplied by two, right? And then it was reversed. Or it was reversed first and then multiplied by two. It doesn't matter which step you want to take first. All right, so let's do that. So we'll multiply this by two. Okay, multiply this by two. And now we get this equation for COF2. 2CO2 plus 2CF4. Okay, 
And because we multiplied by 2, we're raising k to the second power. Okay, so that was the first step. Second step over here is simply reversing that reaction. So when you reverse that reaction, you get this equation here. And so the new k then is now 1 over this number. Okay, and when you do that, you get 2.1 times 10 to the negative 13. So that would be the new value of k. All right, so um, if you thought that was easy, good for you. Um, but if you want a little bit of challenge, here's one challenging one. Um, so you have three different equations with, in which two of them contains the uh, equilibrium constants. So how do you find the first equilibrium constant for this specific reaction? So I'll give you three minutes to solve this one. All right, so let's work this out together. So basically the point here is you're trying to get this reaction equation, right? So can you generate this reaction equation from the two equations? And the answer is yes. So you can see here that the CO2 is on the reactant side. And we have CO2, so I'm just going to call this reaction 1 in reaction 2. Okay? You can see that there is a CO2 here. Right? So we can reverse reaction 1. So the first step is to reverse reaction 1 and we will get CO2 plus H2 and we get CO carbon monoxide plus water vapor. Okay, and because we reversed the first equation, we're taking the inverse of K2. So we'll just put 1 over K2 here. Okay. And then you see that in the overall reaction equation, you have methanol, CH3OH, in the product side. You have CH3OH also here on the product side. So you can just leave it as is. Right, so for the second step, we're going to add this new uh, reaction equation that we just reversed. So we're going to add 1 and 2. Okay, so if we add 1 and 2, the new one, you have CO2 plus H2. You have CO plus H2O. And we're adding reaction number two. CO plus H2. And you get methanol, CH3OH. All right, so when you add the two here, you can see that the carbon dioxide will uh, cancel with this carbon monoxide. Did I say dioxide? Monoxide, right? 
carbon monoxide will cancel out. And let's see, is there something else missing? I think there's supposed to be a two here. There we go. So now we have CO2 plus 3H2, and you get CH3OH in water. which is the reaction that we want, right? And so because we're adding the two, now we're adding or we're multiplying one over K2 times the K value of the second reaction, which is K3. Okay, so when you divide K3 and K2, you get K1. Which is equivalent to 1.4 times 10 to the second power, or 140. Okay, so that would be the answer here. So that's probably a level 2.5 type of question. Sai? K3. So whenever you're adding two reactions, um, that means you would have to multiply their K values, right? So if you're reversing a chemical reaction, you're taking the inverse of K. And if you're multiplying a reaction by some number, changing the coefficient, then you're raising the K value to that number that you multiplied with. All right. So let's look at equilibrium constants involving gases. Okay, so the concentration of a gas in a mixture is actually proportional to its partial pressure. So you can calculate equilibrium constants in terms of the partial pressures. Okay. So let's consider this general equation here for gas. Uh, so your Kc, if you were to write the Kc value here, it would just be concentration of C times concentra concentration of D raised to their coefficients divided by the reactants raised to, the, raised to their coefficients. For Kp, it's actually the same thing, right? Except instead of using concentrations in molarity, you're using partial pressures of the gases, okay? And the partial pressures are in atmospheres, ATM. Okay, so it's the same idea you have products in the numerator divided by um, the partial pressures in, of the reactants in the denominator. So the first one here, Kc, is the reaction equation or the equilibrium equation in terms of concentration and Kp is in terms of uh, partial pressure. Okay, do you guys have any questions regarding this one, this slide? Okay, so whenever you're calculating Kp, make sure that you um, convert the units to atmospheres first, okay, because that's how these equations were derived. Um, but we're not going to be deriving too much, too many equations here using calculus. Okay, um, did you guys know that calculus and alcohol don't go together? Did you guys know that? Because you can't drink and derive. See what I did there? <laughs> okay. All right, so you can actually convert from Kc to Kp, right, using this equation here. Okay, so they're related in terms of this one specific factor here. So it's the ideal ga gas constant R times temperature in kelvins raised to the change in the number of moles N. Okay, and of course the R value is going to be 0 0.0821. You don't have to memorize this number because it should be in the formula sheet. Um, what I'm not sure of is whether this specific equation is on the formula sheet. So if you have it with you, you might want to double check that. If it's not there, then you might want to memorize this equation. 
Okay, so delta N here is the difference between the number of moles, the total number of moles of the reactants and the moles of the products. Okay, and the only time that Kp is equivalent to Kc is when the difference is zero. Okay, meaning the, num the total number of moles of the products equals the total number of moles of the reactants. All right, so how do we derive the relationship between Kp and Kc? Okay, so we know that um, in using molarity, right, for example, molarity is equivalent to number of moles divided by liter, the volume. So if we have a reactant A, right, then the concentration of A is equivalent to the number of moles of A divided by the, num the volume in liters. And if you were to, so if we incorporate the ideal gas law here, because we're working with gases, you can calculate the volume or the concentration of the gas using Pivner, right, PV equals NRT. So all you have to do is divide both sides by volume. So now you have number of moles of A divided by volume, which is concentration of A. Okay. So you can substitute um, number of moles divided by volume by molarity, which is the concentration of the gas A. So partial pressure of A is equivalent to the concentration of A in moles per liter times RT. Okay. So now we have this equation here, right? So for any reactant X or product X, um, the concentration is equivalent to the partial pressure of that gas divided by RT. So how do we relate Kp and Kc? So we know that K in general, all right, let's say you have this uh, equation here, A, plus B, you have C plus D, okay? So you would write the uh, general equilibrium constant expression using this equation. So this is for basically concentration, right, Kc. How do we turn Kc into Kp, right? Or how do we derive these, the equation relating Kp and Kc? So all you have to do is convert these concentrations in terms of the partial pressure. So we have the equation here, right? So you just replace them. So in that case, in terms of pressure, you have partial pressure of C, right, times partial pressure of D, right, divided by RT. So this is divided by RT, divided by RT. So this is for the numerator. For the denominator, you can do the same thing here, right, so constant partial pressure of A over RT times the partial pressure of B divided by RT. Anything missing here? Coefficients. Right, the coefficients. So this is raised to C. This one is raised to D, raised to A, raised to B. And you can simplify these, this equation here by taking out one over RT from the equation, right? So now you have PC, partial pressure of C times partial pressure of D, right? Times one over RT raised to C plus D. And then you can do the same thing for the denominator, PA times PB. 1 over RT, and you have A plus B.
And you can simplify this even further. So now this right here is Kp. Right, this is equivalent to Kp times 1 over Rt, and then the difference in the number of moles, right? So that would be C plus D minus A plus B, which is basically delta N. Right, so that would be the, the new equation relating Kc and Kp. Don't drink and derive, guys. <laughs> All right, so here's a cleaner version. Nope. Oh, so did you guys get that? Okay. And you can switch them if you want. You can, uh, if you're given KP and you're trying to find KC, then you can just use algebra to isolate one from the other. All right, so here's an, uh, an example. We have nitrogen monoxide here that is oxidized to nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere according to this uh, chemical reaction equation. And you're given Kp, how do you find Kc for this reaction, right? So we, we know the equation. So I'm just gonna pull it up here. So here's the equation, Kp equals Kc, RT raised to delta N, okay? So we're given KP, and we have to find KC. So you can rearrange this, or you can just use the equation I gave you. Um, rearranging this, you have KC equals KP times one over RT raised to delta n. Okay. So we have Kp, we know R, 0 0.08 to 1. We know temperature, but this has to be converted into Kelvins. And so it tells you it's room temperature 25 degrees Celsius. Convert that to Kelvins, that's 298 Kelvins. Okay. What about our delta n value? What is this equal to? Negative one. So it's the total number of mole, the coefficient here. So that would be two for the products minus the total here in the reactant. So that's two plus one. So it'd be two minus three. So your delta N then is equivalent to minus one. So we can rewrite this equation Kc equals Kp. divided by 1 over 0 0.0821 times 298 and raise that to a negative 1. And the answer is 5.4 times 10 to the 13th power. We're here until 2.45, right? All right, I think we're almost done here. So what about heterogeneous equilibrium? So what this means is that now you have not just gases, you now have a combination of the different physical states. You can now have solids involved, uh, liquids involved in the reaction, but how do we treat them, right? So the concentrations of pure solids and pure liquids do not change during the course of a reaction. 
So what this means is that because their concentration doesn't change, we don't get solids and liquids involved in the calculation of equilibrium constants. So we just leave them out, right? So we only, we only care about gases and aqueous, okay, ions. So for example, if you have this reaction equation here, carbon dioxide uh, reacting with water, it forms, it releases hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. So what would be the equilibrium constant expression for this specific reaction? So normally you would look at the products, right, the concentration, and then you divide that by the reactants. It will look something like this, right? But because H2O is a liquid, okay, the concentration doesn't change. And so we leave that out. So we'll cross it out, and the correct equilibrium expression is this without the... Uh, H2O, okay? So you might wanna watch out for that. So look for solids and liquids and remove them from the chemical reaction equation or equilibrium expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just ignore it. All right, so here's an example. Write an expression for this reaction. Um, so you have calcium carbonate solid decomposing into carbon calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. So what would be the expression for the equilibrium constant? Right, so it's just K equals CO2. Okay. Very simple. Okay, so um, so how do we calculate equilibrium constants based off of measured concentrations at equilibrium? Okay. So the most direct way of finding the equilibrium constant is to measure the amounts of reactants and products in the mixture at equilibrium. So I want to emphasize that. You don't want to uh, use the initial concentrations. You want to use the concentrations at equilibrium. Okay. So the equations that we've generated, the expression, right? the, the numbers that you plug in there, or the concentrations at equilibrium. All right. So for example, if you have this uh, chemical reaction equation and you want to find the equilibrium constant, this would be the expression, right? The equilibrium expression. Okay. So looking at this table right here, let's say you have all the data, right? And you want to determine the equilibrium constant. Okay. So you're given the initial concentrations, you determine the equilibrium concentrations based on the experiments, and you know the equilibrium constant expression. So all you have to do now is plug in the numbers and get the value of Kc at different concentrations of reactants. So you can see that you actually don't need the initial concentrations. They're not involved in, calcula in the calculation. Okay, so the only thing you have to do is plug and chug plug in the numbers from the equilibrium to the expression to get Kc. Fallon? Say that again? Oh yeah, absolutely. Over here. So this uh, PowerPoint should be available on Blackboard by Wednesday. Okay, after the lecture. Okay, so let's see if we can look at an example here. Um, so whenever you're calculating the equilibrium concentrations or the equilibrium constant, you want to take into account stoichiometry. Okay? Always take into account stoichiometry in your calculations. So what we do is you set up an ICE table. So ICE stands for the initial concentration, the change in concentration, and E for concentration at equilibrium. Okay. So we use the change in the concentration of the sub substance to determine the change in the other chemicals in the reaction. So let's see if we can look at an example here. All right, so consider this reaction. You're given the initial concentrations of the reactant A and the product B. You're also given the concentration of A at equilibrium. So you're gonna set up your ice table 
So it looks something like this. All right, so you're given the initial concentration of A, right, 1.0. You're given the concentration, initial concentration of B and the concentration of A at equilibrium. So for the box here for change, what was the change in the concentration of A? It changed by 0.25, right? So because this is a reactant, you put a negative sign there. So you're subtracting minus 0 0.25, okay? And for B, you do the same thing. So the change here is going to be positive 0.25 because B is a product. The concentration of reactant is decreasing. The concentration of product is increasing, right? So you put plus 0 0.25 here. And then again, you take into account the coefficients, stoichiometry. So you would multiply this by 3, right? Carlin, you multiply this by 3, right? 2. <laughs> Okay, so two because of the coefficient over here. All right, so that's equal 0 0.5. So then you do the math, right? For equilibrium, you have 0.75, which is already given, and then you do the same thing for the product. So zero plus 0 0.5 gives you 0 0.50. So now you can plug these numbers in to the expression for Kc, right? So Kc here, is equivalent to concentration of B at equilibrium raised to the second power divided by A. So in that case, you have 0.5 squared divided by 0.75. And that should give you 0 0.33 as the answer. All right, let's look at an actual example here. All right, consider the following reaction. We're reacting carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas to make methanol. And you did this at 780 degrees Celsius with initial concentrations, right? So you're given initial concentrations of the reactants and one equilibrium concentration. What is the value of Kc, the equilibrium constant? Okay, so we're going to set up our ice table. All right, so we have initial concentration, change in concentration, equilibrium concentration. And then we have the reactants here, CO, H2, and the product CH3OH. So it's always good to go ahead and include the coefficient. So just put 2 in front of the H2. So re that reminds you basically to multiply the change by 2. Okay, so it gives you the concentration, the initial concentration here for CO. It's 0 0.5. You're also given the, con the initial concentration of H2, which is 1.00. What about for methanol? What is our initial concentration? It's not given here. Huh? No. So what is our initial concentration? So that means that, so the question is, what is the initial concentration before the chemical reaction. It would be zero, right? So assume that you don't have any methanol before the chemical reaction. And so now we're looking at change. We don't know. It, do, it doesn't say anything about change. Um, but it tells us the equilibrium concentration of carbon monoxide, which is 0 0.15. So you put that here under equilibrium, 0 0.15. And then for change, 
you subtract a number here, right? To get 0.15. So 0 0.5 minus 0 0.15 is 0 0.35. So you read the change here is 0 0.35. Negative, right? Negative 0 0.35. So that means for hydrogen gas, it's also negative, right? Because it, hydrogen gas is still a reactant. So that would be 2 times negative 0 0.35. Okay. And for methanol, it's positive 0 0.35. And then you can just do the math here. 1 minus 0 0.7 for hydrogen gas. That would be 0 0.3. Right. And then 0 plus 0 0.35 is 0 0.35. Okay. So now you can plug that into the equilibrium expression, which is... CH3OH divided by CO times H2 raised to the second power. So, so we're going to use this information here. So that would be 0 0.35 divided by 0 0.15 times 0 0.3 to the second power. And the answer is 26. So KC equals 26, which is my age. I'm just getting I'm older than 26. <laughs> All right, so this is a cleaner version of the answer here. 26. All right, is that one easy? All right. All right, let's look at this one example right here, which is probably a little, probably a little bit more challenging. Um, so you have this chemical reaction equation. You have the initial concentration of the reactant, meth uh, methane. And it gives you the equilibrium concentration for C2H2, right, which is 0 0.035. So same concept here. You would have to make your ice table here. So you have the reactant CH4. You have the products C2H2 and H2. So it says that the initial concentration of methane is 0 0.115. Okay, and at equ equilibrium, the mixture contains C2H2.035. Okay, what would be the initial concentrations of our products? Zero. zero. So you put zero here. And again, you might want to go ahead and include the coefficients. So for CH4, it's 2. For C2H2, it's 1. And for H2, it's 3. Okay. So um, what would be the change in the concentration for C2H2? Positive 0 0.35. Positive 0 0.35. 0 0.035. Okay. What about for hydrogen gas? Multiply that by three. Okay, and for C two H four or for C H four? It's negative one seven. So that would be negative two times zero point zero three five. All right, and then you do the math here.
So for the first one, for C2H4, the equilibrium, or CH4, the equilibrium concentration is 0 0.045. And for hydrogen gas, it's 3 times 0 0.035, which is 0 0.105. Okay, so these are the numbers that we want. Now we can plug that into the Kc expression. And our Kc expression is hydrogen gas raised to the third power times C2H2 divided by CH4 raised to the second power. So hydrogen gas is 0 0.105 to the third power. All right. And the answer is 0 0.020. Pretty easy, right? Piece of cake. Walk in the park. So this is the cleaner version, and there we go. That's where we're going to stop. Wow, amazing. So you guys have five-minute break before lab starts.